Well, today we're coming to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and this great chapter about faith. Now, it starts with the definition. Uh, this is very helpful. Uh, verse 1, 11, verse 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Straightforward definition. Faith is, if, let me draw it out on, on the kind of in the air, really. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and it is assurance about what we do not see. So confidence and assurance about what we hope for and what we do not see. That's, maybe you can picture that in your mind. Is this a good definition? Well, uh, it probably is. Um, I hope there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. So I have confidence in what I hope for, that there's fairies at the bottom of the garden. I have assurance about what I can't see. I can't see the fairies, but I hope they're there and maybe one day they'll come out. So it's a good definition of, of faith. I have faith in the fairies at the bottom of the garden. Uh, okay, that doesn't take us very far, does it? Um, maybe it's not even very helpful. Is it a good definition of faith? Maybe it's a terrible definition of faith. Let me try and put put it in another way. Faith is confident in something that that we don't have. It's confident in what we hope for. It's assurance of what we can't see. So in this area, what we hope for, what we can't see is there's uncertainty, there's unknown, there's a, maybe a future element to it, all that kind of thing. And the idea is having confidence and assurance about those things which we don't have or can't see or aren't happening yet. Let me try and give you another example. Suppose at this half term you want to um, blow your bank account and uh, have a holiday in Paris. So you go down to Manchester to get on a plane. Now, faith is having uh, confidence in what you hope for. You hope that the plane will take you to Paris. It's having assurance but what you do not see. You do not see, well, have you seen the fuel in the plane? Have you spoken to the pilot? Have you interviewed the pilot to make sure that he or she has actually hadn't had too much to drink or has flown a plane before? Have you talked to all the engineers who do the maintenance on the plane since it last flew? Uh, have you checked how how long the bits of the plane have been in place? Do they need replaced? Have you, you see what I mean? You have confidence in what you hope for you have assurance about what you do not see but why have you confidence why have you um what's the other word? assurance do you know that plane is roadworthy airworthy what about the air traffic controllers what if they happen to just go on a, a, a lightning strike at the moment your plane takes off or the main one drops dead and the other one's too junior to know what to do next. Uh, you have confidence and, and assurance about what you hope for, what you cannot see. But you see how, how nebulous it is. I mean, should you be having confidence and assurance about what you can't see and what you hope for? Uh, maybe I'm making you scared to go on this trip to Paris. See, everything we do in life, almost everything we do, depends on faith. Almost every situation in life that we need to step into means we are trusting someone we have not met or trusting a thing which we have never tried before or trusting a long string of maybe situations which might or might not have happened or people who might or might not be reliable. Now, when you get into your car in the morning to go to work, uh, you're trusting maybe, depending on how long your journey is, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000 drivers, yourself and all the other drivers in all the other cars, 
and the people who made those cars and uh, that the MOT tests have been done properly and that the cars have been serviced reasonably often and that the tyres aren't worn and that the road isn't going to have so many potholes that if you, you bounce into an accident. Do you see what I mean? So many things you take on trust in life. Almost everything we take on trust. So the question really about faith, about trust is, is what I'm trusting in reliable? Now, uh, I do, I would love there to be fairies at the bottom of the garden. But I think if you took me seriously on this, if I really pushed this and you tried to make it a thing that I really wanted, you would say I'm stupid and that my faith is stupid faith. Because it's faith in something I'm making up. There's nothing really, there's no real likelihood that the fairies will appear if they exist. So my faith is not based in anything worthwhile. Now, if you're going to fly to Paris, you know that aeroplanes can fly. You don't look as if they can because they're too big and heavy, but you've seen them fly and maybe you've flown before and you know other people who've flown before. Maybe you've been in a car lots of times and you haven't yet had an accident or seen an accident. Um, so, in a sense, you're, you're trusting in the statistical likelihood that you'll survive the journey. Uh, you're trusting in experience. So, what you're putting your trust in is something which has worked in the past. Let me give you another example. Suppose I visit your house and I go into the sitting room and you say, oh, you know, have a seat. And you point to a, a, an easy chair. Now, I've got a big decision to make then, haven't I? What if you've booby-trapped that easy chair? How am I supposed to know? What if the chair is just too old to take my weight? What if it's not really a chair, but you've played some kind of tricks in the room that makes me think... You, you see what I mean? I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to sit in it. But you see, by doing that, I have put my trust in you that your offer is genuine, that you've got the power to deliver the offer, that the chair is a chair you know and you can verify. But it's done automatically. But I have faith in you and your promise and your word so that I sit down with confidence in what I hope for, a comfortable seat, with assurance about um, what I do not see. I do not see myself yet sitting in that chair, but I have assurance that that will happen. So I do it. I go for it. Same with the aeroplane, same with the car. Because there's a trustworthiness about the thing we're stepping into. But let me give another example. This is really coming more to, to, to things that people think of as religious faith. Um, many people say to me, you know, if I ask them, you know, what do you think happens when you die? Uh, they often say something like, well, I hope there's something here. I hope that you are, uh, that uh, you death, uh, after, there's an afterlife and it's a good place. Now, is that different from fairies at the bottom of the garden? I mean, it matters more because whether there's fairies at the bottom of the garden or not probably doesn't really matter. But if we live after death. Doesn't that matter? Isn't that important? Whether it's true, you know, if it's true, it's important. If it's not true, that's also important. But the question is, if I'm putting my trust in, in a hope, well, well I mean, um, confidence in what I hope for, assurance about what I do not see. But what reason have I got for that confidence? Where do I get my assurance from that it might happen? Who am I trusting? What am I trusting? I trust you and your chair. I trust the aeroplane. I trust Ryanair. I trust whoever it is, the, the, the people that have been involved, the hundreds of people involved in that one flight. I trust all the other drivers. I trust the car manufacturers and the, uh, you know, the government's uh, MOT system and so on. There's something to trust. But if I am looking at I mean, is it, am I trusting in God? If I'm not a, somebody who's a kind of a 
a keen Christian. Am I trusting in God? And what God am I trusting in? And do I know God enough to say, you will, you are offering me life after death and it's good, not bad. Now, I want to suggest that is a massive shot in the dark. That is, I mean, it's, it's basically wishful thinking. How on earth can you know? You're guessing and hoping, you're crossing your fingers and saying, that's the best I can do. I'm trusting in this. I've got full confidence in this. So faith is a massive thing. It's a massive thing in the world for every single human being. But what we're talking about here, really, because we're looking at the Bible, because we're thinking about God, because it's a, a Christian sermon from a, a Christian church, we're thinking about faith and God. So let me go back to Hebrews 11. I'll read it again. Uh, now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, confidence in what we hope for, assurance by what we do not see. Uh, as that ball, if you cut that out and made a fridge magnet just of that, then it's stupid and pointless and irrelevant because it could mean fairies, it could mean some afterlife that you've no idea what it is or where it comes from. It could be anything. But if you look around this verse and say, well, what's the writer talking about? What's he been talking about before? What's he going to talk about next? You know, what's the context? Well, if you look up a few verses in Hebrews 10, 36, the writer's saying, I mean, he's picking up what he's said right up to this point in the whole, whole book. 10, 36, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. So saying to Christians, uh, you've got to keep going. Don't give up. Don't, don't um, lose, lose, um, lose your, your idea, lose your confidence uh, in, what, in what's going on. Persevere. So that you'll receive what he has what he has promised. So God has promised something. Well, let's read on verse 40, 37. For, and then he's quoting from the Old Testament, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Now, clearly here he's talking about Jesus coming back, the second coming, the return of Jesus Christ. So the writer is saying, uh, persevere uh, because God has made a promise. And it's something to do with Jesus coming back. That's that's going to happen. And verse 38, here another quotation. But my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. So the righteous ones, the ones that, that belong to God, they will live by faith or they will, they will have life because they believe. And the implicit there is believing in the God who gives life, the God who, who gives righteousness. And then verse 13, well, and then there's this kind of um, uh, warning. You be careful because some people might, you might shrink back. And therefore, uh, that's, that's not good. Verse 39, but the writer says, we do not belong to those, including himself and his readers. We do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. There's a, a bad fate there if you shrink back. But we belong to those who have faith and are saved. In other words, we're the, we belong to those who have trust in what God has said and what God has promised about what happens when Christ comes back. We are those who uh, have faith and are saved, not destroyed, but saved. And then he says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. In other words, what we're hoping for is Christ coming back according to God's promise. Faith is assurance about what we do not see. We do not see Christ yet returned. In fact, it doesn't even look like it will happen. But we have assurance about what we do not see. And then he goes on to say, verse 2 of 11, this is what the ancients were commended for. And he's going to spend the rest of the chapter talking about different people and different groups of people who heard what God said and put their trust in what he said. And... Uh, and we join them. If we're going to persevere and be saved, we join them in that trusting in God and his promises. So the chair, <clears throat> you offer me to sit down. So the big question is, when you offer me that chair, are you being trustworthy? The issue is not about my faith, is it? The issue is about you and your promise. 
my faith is easy. If I think you're trustworthy, if you seem to me to be the kind of person that isn't kind of pulling my leg or playing a game or doesn't want to ruin me, then I'm just going to sit in the chair. Simple. So the issue is not my faith. The issue is your trustworthiness. Ferris at the bottom of the garden. Uh, now, where do I get the idea that there might be fairies at the bottom of the garden? Well, is it a trustworthy source? Uh, not really unlikely. So if I say, oh, they're going to come out tonight, I'm trusting in make-believe. I'm trusting in fairy tales. And that's stupid faith. For the chair, it's not stupid faith because you are trustworthy or you're apparently trustworthy, so it's reasonable to trust you. The fairies, it's not reasonable to trust the fairy stories. So therefore, if I put my faith in that, I'm stupid. Uh, getting on the plane to Paris, it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, many people have done it and survived. Uh, lots of people do it. I've known everyone I've known who's done it has survived. So it's a reasonable thing to do to step because I'm trusting you. Ryanair is trustworthy. They vet their pilots. They uh, air traffic controllers don't tend to go on strike, at least not without notice. You, you know that kind of thing. So, so there's a trustworthy element to the, the implicit promise. So when I get the explicit promise on my airline ticket, which basically says we will take you to Paris if you pay this amount of money, then that promise it's a worthwhile promise. So. I just get in the plane. It's not, I'm not having, I don't think I'm taking a great step of faith by getting in the plane. But it is a step of faith. But it's because the one I'm trusting is trustworthy. And therefore, um, I have confidence what I hope for. I hope that the plane will get me to Paris. I have assurance about what I do not see. I do not see the plane flying me to Paris yet. But because the offer is from a trustworthy source, then that's great. Now, I, I want to make make this a bit more serious now um, uh, in, in two different kind of ways. Um, one is, suppose you've got a um, uh, an aunt who's very ill. And you're saying to your believer, you're a Christian, you're going to God and saying, God, I, 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 would, I, love, I, I want my aunt to get better. Please make her better. Now, what is faith in that scenario? Can God make her better? Yes, he can. The Bible is pretty clear on that. Is it right for us to ask? Yes, the Bible is clear on that too. Is God, is God worth trusting? Well, the Bible makes that pretty clear. And Christians over the centuries, Christians we know, uh, we ourselves maybe have been able to see that God is trustworthy because we've trusted him in the past. So, does that mean that when I have that I that I have confidence in what I hope for that my aunt will get will, will recover completely, that I have assurance but I don't see I don't see yet her recovery? Does that mean my faith in God will guarantee that she will get better? Now I want to say the answer there is no. I mean, she might get better. God in His love and grace says, might heal her. And for me to pray for that is not bad. Is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to pray for something good for the aunt, the aunt that I love who's ill. But what I want to suggest isn't in case you're, there isn't really, um, uh, while God can heal anyone and everyone totally, completely at any moment, he hasn't promised to do that universally every time anyone prays. Now, Ryanair has promised, if you have the ticket and you've paid the money, they have promised they will deliver you to Paris. Your promise of the chair is very clear. If I sit down in this chair now, it will hold me up. But God has not issued a promise that every time you pray for someone you know who's ill, they will get better. And this is, I think, where it's difficult. Uh, God says we should pray for what is on our heart, what we desire, what is in line with God's will so far as we know it. God is trustworthy, but he hasn't made an explicit promise about 
someone who's ill or a specific person who's ill or that everyone who's ill will be healed. Now, back to this, it, it's not about my faith, it's about the, the faithfulness of the one I'm putting my faith in. Let me think of let me think uh, bring another uh, thing that God has promised. God has promised that everyone who trusts him will receive eternal life. So if I come to God and say, uh, Lord, I want to turn to you, I want to give up my own life, come to you uh, and you've promised eternal life, will I receive it? The answer is yes, because that is a promise to everyone who puts their trust in Jesus. That's a guaranteed promise. It's like the Ryanair ticket. But God hasn't, God has said explicitly, if you trust me for that, I will deliver. But he hasn't said, if you trust me to heal someone, I will deliver. In his grace and as he might, but it's not a guarantee. So if one way to put it is that there's a, there's a secret unknown will of God. And there's a revealed will of God. So it's not secret. It's revealed in scripture. If we are praying about and hoping for having our confidence or trusting God in the revealed will of God, then the promises God has made, the statements he has made that are categorical, then we can have total confidence that we will, he, God will deliver that. But if it's God's secret will that he hasn't revealed, then unless he speaks very individually and personally to me, which may happen, but it's not usual in this day and age, then I cannot be certain that my aunt will be healed. Now, that's not a lack of faith. If you like, it's an, a lack of an explicit promise from God that he will do that particular thing. I can keep calling to him to do it, praying to him to do it, but I don't need more faith or greater faith or I don't need a way to, to twist my faith to make God act. I'm putting my trust in a God who's loving and caring, but hasn't expressly said he will do that. Whereas there are other things he has expressly said that I can put my trust in and know that he will deliver. The danger is we say, faith is all about me, me and my faith. But actually it's about the faithfulness of the one who has promised what has he promised? What has God promised? And am I trusting in the words he has said? Yes, we pray about things he hasn't spoken about to deliver. But we have so much to go for, so much to trust in God that he has definitely promised that he will deliver. I want to finish in verse 3 uh, because verse 3 is, uh, well, it's verse I've been given along with verses 1 and 2 uh, for this sermon. And this is really the start of the writer beginning to open up uh, people who trusted in God in the Old Testament. So he starts off with uh, the idea of, of um, creation, really, here in verse 3. Let me read verse 3. By faith, so he's just said faith is confidence in what we hope for and so on. Uh, it's what the ancients were commended for. And then verse 3 he says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So it's saying that we believers, we, we are trusting God, uh, we by faith understand that what exists in the world we have, the heavens and the earth and so on, that that was made at God's command. In other words, God spoke specifically and we believe that it happened. Now, whether when it says um, uh, what what is seen was not made out of what was visible, uh, that could be that God created from nothing the world as we see it now. Or it could mean that God made visible what had been invisible. So if you like, it emerged into view, it emerged into existence from a, a different dimension. Uh, but we're putting our trust in God that he spoke and promised and what he said came true. The world is in place and it existed. So you see how faith works? God speaks something specific, something clear, and we trust him that it has happened and then we live in it. And that's how it will work through uh, the rest of, of Hebrews 11 here. 
God makes a specific promise. We trust him for that promise, even though we don't see it coming yet. So as a Christian, and I want to finish in this, as a Christian, I'm not trusting in some vague hope of an afterlife that might be good. I'm trusting in, a specific, in many specific promises of God in Scripture that God has promised for those who put their trust in him, they will, when they die, be with God forever and ultimately be resurrected into a new heaven and a new earth. And I believe that because God has spoken to in Scripture, because Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who, who die and are raised again. And many, many other things. So my hope as a Christian is in something concrete. God who has spoken trustworthily. And therefore I trust him that I will live forever in his kingdom. Not because I've got great faith. Not because I'm good or because I'm any, any, anything in me deserves that. But because God has spoken crystal clearly. And he is trustworthy. And that is where, why we put our faith in him.